Well, guess what? I'm back. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't going to be able to stay away uh, for too long. It was a very good and necessary break, but um, whatever this thing is, um, I feel that I've cracked through to another level of its analysis. And, you know, I'm crunching on this stuff um, in the background anyway, so I might as well document it. Um, but the format's going to be a little bit different now. Um, first of all, we have a completely new uh, vessel of the imagination here. Um, I've switched players. We're using I-I-N-A now. Maybe you just say Inna. I don't know. Um, this is a very young player. It's version 1.01, .01, I think. And VLC is great as a cross-platform tool, but at least on Mac, this thing destroys it in terms of performance. Um, I've kind of combined that with a annotation app and my Wacom tablet <laughs> to get a pretty fluid um, analysis environment here. Um, I can draw on top of live video now and, um, you know, set up little, little looping sections like I've done up here with Razor 3. Um, and I can run multiple videos, no problem, and record it all while we do it, and works great. Um, the only minor downside of this, maybe it's a downside, I don't know, is that um, there's not going to be as much webcam action, um, because I this new vessel is really optimized for sort of the full screen experience. So um, I'm going to get out of the way very shortly, and we're just going to dive back into some pictures here. Um, before I do that, I guess I do want to try, like, <laughs> give some kind of attempt to summarize um, what we've done so far on the archive uh, and what we discovered in this film in particular. Um, I guess the other thing I should say about this is that... Um, the work now has entered a different phase, so I think it demands a slightly different approach. Um, for one thing, I just don't have the time anymore to, to do really like detailed edits. So my idea with this has been, let's streamline the analysis tools so that I don't have to edit. We can do it completely live. Everything I would want to show, um, I can just draw or bring media in, throw it up, do cross analysis all right here. Um, so if I can't have it running on the screen while I'm actually talking about it, it's just not gonna be on the screen. I think I have to make that a pretty pretty serious rule this time. Because um, otherwise I just get so bogged down in the form and the aesthetic and all this and trying to make it all nice and really try to support my arguments with all these pictures and all of this, it's like, it just takes forever. So anyway, I know I've complained about that aspect of this before at various stages of this, but I think now, um, now that I've got it full control over everything just from my pen, you know, um, I think that we're going to be able to pull this off finally <laughs> in the way it probably should have been all along, which is just almost like a live cast. And actually it would be interesting at some point to try to do these live. I don't know how good my internet is at the moment, but that um, yeah, would be interesting to try that. Well, so anyway, um, we began this with a question about 9-11 and the notion of precognition, unconscious precognition. And the question was kind of, well, what if what if precognition can happen in a distributed kind of way where it's affecting a whole lot of different people, let's say kind of creative artistic people at the same time, and they think they're doing one thing, which is that they're making some series of films. Um, but actually what they're doing is they're making a unified trilogy. Um, or I don't know why I jumped to trilogy. I have this strange preference for threes. 
It's triplanar analysis. And while we're going to see something very interesting here when we take a look at some of these pictures again, is that my titling of the hermeneutic system in that way may have been somewhat prescient because it really does seem that these images are split into three, almost like three planes of uh, depth. It's funny, I, I feel like we almost need to get these images now into um, like a 3D environment so we can sort of actually see how they're layered. Um, but anyway, it doesn't have to be a trilogy. They think they're making some series of films, but actually they all slot together as part of some giant um, over-narrative, uh, except it was an unconscious one, and one that maybe predicted 9-11. Very, very weird thing, but it, it seems like we kind of maybe found some data that fits that idea. In my opinion, some pretty found some pretty powerful stuff. And it's weird because it started, didn't it, with a a symbolic series of correspondences. This notion of the red twins. This was just a structure, a pattern that we tracked through, you know, several film series, the Gremlins and Back to the Future, and then the three Hellraiser films. And the notion there was that two burning two identical burning objects. It's the identical part is important. It can't just be two burning things, probably. I mean, maybe sometimes, in fact, I know, I do sometimes include things like that, but they have to be contextually supported by other stuff in that case. Um, but basically the idea was that the twinness can be thought of as representing the Twin Towers and the fact that they're red is as if they're burning. And look, that's a little tiny pattern in isolation. It, doesn't mean much, but the funny thing we found was that it, it appears in some very particular contexts, uh, seemingly fairly repetitively, at least in the films that we looked at. And I can tell you that it, it appears quite repetitively in many more films that we haven't looked at. In fact, I'd like to direct your attention towards um, an IMDb list that I put up. Now I have to awkwardly reach up here. Not the best thing. But I'm not going to be on webcam for very long here. Um, so, you know, basically, here they are. Um, well, actually, let's get this in a more viewable. Let's just, let's just look at the pictures <laughs> in keeping with uh, the emerging attitude on this channel. Um, so here's all the films. Right now, um, it's sitting at 73, I think. Um, I have organized these chronologically. So, uh, you know, in terms of their release. Uh, you can see it, it goes up to films quite a bit, you know, quite recent stuff. Um, Anyway, this pattern appears in all of these films in these same sorts of ways. So check them out if you want to kind of wander off into some side corridors here on your own. Um, well, so it started with a bunch of interesting symbolic correspondences, things that seemed like they, in a symbolic way, and in a loosely imagistic way, we're describing 9-11. But then we ran into something very, very funny when we started um, analyzing that Radiohead stuff. Remember? Um, this is terrible. I can reach over this. Oh, uh, I have something to say about that calculator, but we'll get to that in a second. Uh, right. Residential nemesis is what I want. So this is a painting by Stanley Donwood, who's an artist that works with Radiohead. Um, if you're just jumping in now, uh, you know, there's an episode about this on the archive. I spend a little over an hour um, talking about this painting and other work from this period. Um, in my opinion, 
this is a precognitive content. Um, here we have the sense of the sense of twin towers. Whoops. Huh. Don't know how that happened. A funny thing with the pin sort of snap to position instead of mouse mode thing or something. Still working out the bucks here. <laughs> uh, sense of two rectangles. Explosion coming out of the right hand side. Um, right hand side of this is, gets confusing. Right hand side of the towers. <laughs> the left, the the lower left hand side of the image, of course. Uh, almost a sense of a plane here. Um, this isn't a great copy of this image, actually, but this particular shape. Uh, we, actually, you know, we might as well get this open in another tab. My argument, um, and now is maybe a good time to open up the annotation tools, is that this shape here is a pretty tight match for this shape here. Not just in the gestalt outline that I just did, but also in terms of some very particular um, details. Let's get this a little larger here. As you see here, we have the the sense of, I call them teeth often. And we have, again, it's, it's hard to see here, but we, we have the same sort of, we can call this toothed uh, uh, pattern on this shape. So, so it's, it's a bit of a double match, you see? It matches the gestalt outline and it matches the pattern detail. And you'll note that it is also, in, in a global sense, in the correct region of the frame. <laughs> and of course, and this is in the correct region of the frame, and, the, and there's a diagonal relationship, you see, between these two elements. Here, let's do that in, um, I'm really loving this environment, by the way. We, we can really see connections here in a better way <laughs> than we could before. Um, yeah, so it preserves the, di I call this the diagonality. The diagonality is preserved here. Furthermore, there are other aspects of this that I find quite correspondent. Um, you know, for instance, uh, these strong white highlights appear here by virtue of the time of day. You know, it's funny. It's perfectly lit, this image. You know, you couldn't have picked a better time to photograph this. But, you know, we, we, we have this here, also in the Radiohead image, right? Uh, you know, we went through all this in the Amnesiac video, maybe not quite in this level of detail because I didn't have the drawing tools. Um, um, and here, in case it was unclear, here's the sense of the plane, right? Explosion. I also think that if you if you look at the smoke outline there, <laughs> I've already given it away by calling it smoke outline. But there's a sense in which it's an almost it, it does double duty. It's the mouth, or I sometimes think of them as sunglasses on the uh, north tower. But it also it's the way it sort of merges into the background in Donwood's painting, carries the sense of this shape as well. This, um, very striking aspect of this image. It's just like it's flipped there, you know? Well, so that's not the only thing we found when we looked at, um, Radiohead and Don Wood and Amnesiac and all this. So there's a ton of stuff that points in the direction of 9-11. But to me, this, this was something very new 
that happened in the course of the analysis because it it doesn't really rely on symbolic connections. There's just a lot of formal correspondence between the pictures. Well, and then we analyze this film, Hellraiser 3. I'll just minimize this for now because I'm sure we're gonna want it back. Probably don't need this anymore. Um, what we found in Hellraiser 3 was essentially a cache of images that work like that Donwood painting. They, um, they match in high dimensional ways. Uh, we discovered some additional things. I didn't actually talk about this high level stuff so specifically in, the, in, in what ended up being a nearly seven hour analysis of this film. Um, we hit on a ton of stuff. All this image match material, I let just kind of speak in the, um, in the edit, in the pictures, I, I didn't, at the time it felt somehow incorrect to mention it explicitly, but I, I think I've changed my mind about that, obviously, since I'm making this video. Um, so now we're going to talk about it explicitly. These image matches occur in a couple ways in this film. Um, and well, now I think it's probably time for me to disappear and for us to just get down to business. Um, so I'm going to do that, but I want to get slightly more comfortable. So I'm going to do a little live edit here. Okay. So just by the way, the idea is to keep this very casual. So you're all going to have to get used to my various vocal tics <laughs> and uh, long pauses while I think about what I'm going to say and all that kind of stuff. Um, I was in the middle of explaining some high level information about these image matches. So these matches manifest in this film in a number of different ways. Tentatively, I'm going to say I see three primary ways that these matches occur. Uh, the first way is something we're actually about to see. Of course, we're looking at a, an image of the Twin Towers here. Hickox dissolves this shot into an image of a television set. So let's see if we can disable this loop. Tell us about your book. And we will... <laughs> in a very meta moment, <laughs> uh, do the same thing that is occurring in the film, which is that we are going to scrub around this image a little non-linearly. Um, that's a good grab. Okay. Well, so this is one way that we get these matches. We get explicit explicitly like pictures on television sets that display a mixture of symbolic and sort of visual geometric formal correspondence. Um, let's see here. Can I get one? Yeah, that's even better because we have the two, uh, I guess it's like orange juice. Uh, and actually we are slightly overexposed here. I've gained the ability to make these pretty dark frames more visible uh, very easily, so this is fantastic and just a very cool feature of this player. Um, but I've got to remember that I have that like <laughs> turned up to a million. Okay. Well, let's just get up the, um, you know, the reference object. <laughs> We're going to talk about holograms at some point. The main thing that I'm interested in in this image 
is the clustering of red and yellow tones in the lower left side. So that to me is a very striking element of this image. You know, there's a re it's all blue over here. <laughs> then over here, there's this real change in color tone that's kind of emphasized a number of times, right? Because we have the pinkish red pillow, the yellow jacket, the red, I don't even know what that is, sculpture or something in the foreground. Uh, and then we have this strange, what must be a, a kind of an, well, what's emergent and what isn't in this kind of a situation. But this one, also, why am I not drawing? Sorry, <laughs> it's going to take a minute to get used to the new um, control deck here. Um, yeah, let's just sort of work with this a little bit. So we just have all this stuff happening here, including this weird reflection that I was just about to describe. This is something about the set has caused a kind of pink hued, yeah, light spec to appear just in kind of perfect alignment with Joey's head and the rest of all this stuff going on here. So to me, that's a real strong match, particularly because we just cut from an image of the literal image of the Twin Towers. Another thing of interest to me here, though, is that we have a, we have a symbolic idea of twins because we have these identical, I, I think I said orange juice cup uh, placements here. Each one is kind of aligned with a figure, so there's a kind of a natural um, <laughs> association there. It's as if we have two twins. One's kind of has all these colors implying fire, uh, and also exposed flesh which they make a lot of in this scene. If you remember from the analysis, this becomes um, quite thematized. So, you know, kind of put that together. I, I know this is really kind of gross and strange, but fire and flesh, it's kind of, you know, burning people. And then it, well, we'll talk about this region of, the, part of what I want to do is meditate a little more strongly on the 9-11 image itself. I want to think about it in terms of sort of projection and association space. What are the unconscious things that we might be seeing when we look at this picture? Because that's the stuff that I think, that I think somehow <laughs> in some ghostly kind of way, floated backwards through time into these media artifacts and popped out as these little symbolic tableaus. Ah, see, I have undo just built into the pen here. It's so nice and fluid, you can just really work. Um, so I just, in the way of just sort of, you know, the only way, something this weird and complicated, but also kind of so simple in a weird way, it's all just about how these pictures line up, but something like this, <laughs> whatever it is, the only way to crack into it is to just start talking about it. So I'll just say right now that this um, blue on this side is, is something I notice. It's, uh, on the one hand, we do have blue dominance over here. Actually, you know, let's, it feels very wrong to write <laughs> blue in red. I actually do have more detailed controls over here. Slightly a bit of a pain to go over here and do this, but let's leave this up for now. Um, we have all this blue energy here, and it is true that if you were to kind of look at this image, the, the blue gets deeper and richer up here. It, it, that's such a subtle aspect of the image. 
I wonder if something like that, <laughs> who knows, we're speculating about things we really don't understand now, but um, I just do notice an association of blue with North Tower resonators. I think there are a number of reasons for this, which probably we should talk about later so that we don't get super derailed here. Basically, I would, I would say that this figure is the North Tower. Joey is the South Tower. And so this kind of thing globally then constitutes a certain category of, of match that we find in Hellraiser. Uh, again, if you're just tuning in, you know, remarkably, <laughs> it's not like this is the only time this kind of thing happens in this movie. It, it happens so frequently. Um, but so sometimes it happens on TVs. Um, never quite this high dimensionally. This is probably the strongest statement, but there are several other tableaus involving televisions that have um, what I call handedness. They have this kind of handedness, just to say a, a clustering of yeah, fire colors in the, on the lower left-hand side. And very often, you know, gray or blue or white tones up here in and you know so that and in this correct diagonal relationship then globally so i think that has to do just with metal actually kind of metal and electricity and lightning and all of that i i want to say are unconscious things that hover around this image you know that's like a lightning rod it's as if the tower was struck by lightning I also think there's a subliminal clock hand here, which really makes this a clock tower then. But anyway, it's the sense of aluminum. I think that this, this antenna is a really important part of this image in terms of how your brain makes sense of this image and in, in terms of the symbolic meaning of the image, if we were to think about that. So another thing I want to say here before we move on is that um, here, let's just clear the skunk. Um, is that something else begins to happen in this image? I actually think this image merges two types of match because there's also something that's sort of spilling out of the TV frame here, which is that we do have a sense of two rectangles at this higher level of pattern in the image. And it does preserve something of the, of the structure of this image because, you know, this one is the one with all the controls. So it's the communication tower, right? So that's the North Tower. Then over here we have another rectangle, and this one has a yellow light. <laughs> so that's the one that has the explosion. So that's the South Tower. And well, then what we see in the image corresponds to that, especially because you know the book that they're talking about here is on this, oh, let's use an indicator. <laughs> is on this side. So again, it, you know, that aligns to the communication side. I'm just seeing now, um, you know, as we look at this a little closer, that we do also have a trophy up here in very 
close here. Let's um can I actually get out of this for a second? I have to figure out how to do this now. Oh, what I want to do is just scale this up for a second so that you can um, really see what's going on. Uh, so you see it's in it's in very close proximity. Also now this is in the way. I'm so sorry. Just a second. Let's make that small. Her head's connected to that trophy, so she's a metal head. Helmet head. So she really is the you know, with the book here. I know Joey wrote the book, but you've got to think about how it how it falls together in the picture. And so, so there's books over here as well, you know. It's definitely the communication side, and then here's all the dials. <laughs> it's amazing how well it works. How well it well it always seems to work. So okay, um I have to get back to my god, managing the window focus is a little bit of a headache, but I think it's gonna become second nature soon enough. Um so that the stuff that's happening outside of the frame. See, it's as if there's two planes in this image, you know? This alignment, it's, it's kind of happens twice. It, it happens on, on the one hand, uh, here, in the way that these fall together, and then, it, and then it happens again, almost like fractally, here, the way that this all comes together. And then this thing, this very strange element, which I don't know, I mean, it will, we'll magnify it in a second, but it, to me, it's, it's, it's this shape that's really not so distant from the general shape of this. It really is evocative of a little explosion. That thing kind of bridges these two planes together because it, it's an effect that's literally sitting on the surface of the screen. So it kind of literally in the space is in some strange in-between zone, but then it fits in perfect alignment, and so it aligns the planes, see? That's, to me, that's uh, something unusual is going on in this picture. I wonder how that looks to other folks, like, <laughs> uh, uh, Alan Waller and I were just discussing this stuff. Um, Ellen makes a really good point that, that, that this could reflect just a, a strange um, emergent kind of aesthetic preference to do with the, the lateralization of the brain. And, uh, well, I really agree with that. I think that that is going on too, probably. But then there are these precise things happening. Uh, it's, it's very hard to figure out, but... Gosh, and then the placement of this adjacent to the just the image of the literal twins with the Brooklyn Bridge and all this just I don't know, it's very, very weird anyway. <laughs> um well, okay. So that's basically this one type. We have a lot of stuff that involves TVs. We've already seen kind of how it can just happen in the frame. Um, let's see here, I need to get my mouse back. And we're going to go over here and go back into full screen. Um, okay. I'm trying to think of a good example of the third type. <laughs> well, there's so many. I mean, there's a lot in this scene. Maybe we'll just look at both. I mean, so we've seen it a few times here, but... Here's one that I think is really is very striking. Um, gosh, where is it here? Uh, yeah, I should use the trackpad. Uh, this is quite precise now. Okay, mixture of trackpad and tablet. 
really allows to get allows precise uh, positional triangulation here. <laughs> uh, this image, um, here. Let's slightly um, enhance this. <laughs> A little more saturation to you so you can sort of see what's going on in that picture. Um, yeah. You know, it's definitely an image of a rectangle. And here there's a handprint. Now I find this remarkable, and I see this quite a bit. Um, it's hard to pull the hue there from the, from the image, but I'm pretty sure it's a red hand. Um, if it was a person standing out here, touching their hand to the image, it would be their left hand. But if it was this guy or something else behind the image extending their hand outwards, it would be the right hand. So that's why it's the right hand. That's why it's the red right hand. <laughs> And that's why we see this. That's why we see double R's often um, as part of these tableaus. In fact, we see that in this film even. Um, I didn't note that in the analysis because these were things that uh, at that time were just on the very boundary of my perception. Um, so it's the red right hand, even though it appears on the lower left hand side of the image always, which it does here correctly. Here we have an element that to me looks quite a bit like an antenna. So it's just slightly shifted down in the image. You know, it, that element just kind of ought to be up here, but it's, it's very, very close. Um, obviously we're gonna read this hand as an explosion, right? So that's the explosion. That means that kind of there's a phantom south tower here and then this one that has it also kind of looks like i'm not sure what this is some kind of implication of lines up there almost like a little tube there even <laughs> um, you know this is clearly you can see it's part of some kind of a crown of thorns design so there's also a sense of a helmet here so again it's like you know aluminum elements that go on the head quote unquote of it it's the metal head. So, so there it is. There's, there's that shape. That's the shape, by the way, of the Red Twins constellation. <laughs> That's it. And there it is, perfectly. And it also, whoops. Let's see, can I accurately scrub through time here? I have to press my button that momentarily changes my window focus. I have to pause it and then I have to, well, I just have to let it play actually. There we go. This really says it. It says it, you know. It's really, it's really dark. It's really dark. It is somehow really dark. It also occurs to me that I've kind of drawn a clock here. Weird. Um, everything about this is really strange. What I was trying to do there was I was trying to undo, but I think I had my window focus wrong. There we go. Um, because I also wanted to draw your attention to the fact that there's like, it's like a mouse hole or something, but you know, it's a, it's a replication of this shape, which is another mouth. So the notion of kind of open, like, yeah, like horrified open mouths is 
hovering on the right hand side of the image. Um, you know, that should be really familiar. <laughs> Well, and then again, it's, and actually I'm noticing some of this for the first time because I, you know, it's very weird for me to watch this movie, I have to say. This to me is, uh, how did this image get here? <laughs> um, but there are further, the whole frame now, okay, so shift, shift focus away from this and just out into the global frame. Look at all these cylindrical aluminum elements. And also, I think maybe that's a, I think maybe this is like a TV and stereo equipment here, right? Don't we see that in, um, in a previous uh, shot? This is slightly unfortunate. Radical. I guess the way to do it is to... Radical. Yeah, so there it is, actually. So it is. It's a giant communication tower here. <laughs> yeah, so that's a giant communication tower. Wow, you've got great taste. Which then it's makes great. it into this scene. Um, and so that extends kind of upwards out of the frame, right? We imagine that this continues up here a bit. So it's up in, it's very much in the upper right. Uh, and then we have, you know, again, exposed flesh in the correct diagonal relationship. And I actually think that her hair and the color temperature of it and the general shape of it and all of this is again, quite a tight match for um, what I refer to as the atomic kid, this strange, well, well, we'll talk about this in a second, but I think you can see the sense in which this isn't so far away. You have to think a little bit like um, a neural network you know, match the image properties. Look at the texture. It's very, very close. It's very close. Well, and then additionally, we have wood on this side, and which burns, wood burns. So the associations are all correct, and it occurs again fractally. It happens twice, twice in one global shot. One last thing to say about this, just to show you kind of how how un unusual this really is. I, things like this just... Because you can look at these pictures for a while and somehow not perceive very obvious shape relationships like this, but there really is a kind of a this sort of shape here. I don't remember exactly, and I don't really like looking at those images so much, but... There were a lot of memes made about 9-11 right after 9-11, and still, I'm pretty sure there's, you know, a deal with it. GIF of this out there, I don't know. But anyway, it definitely does kind of have that shape. It, it subliminally looks very much like a man in, or a man, you know, a figure with sunglasses and, you know, some kind of weird helmet, maybe, with a spike on it, right? Um, but it also, because it's toothed like this, resembles a mouth. So we have all that together in the correct area. But then I, I think we also have an echo of it here, don't we? I mean, don't we? <laughs> Which, again, it's on the right. You know, it's, now it's shifted down. But it's in connection with the communicate with the communication tower here again. 
that, you guys, that wigs me out. Things like that are very strange, especially when they're stacked up like this in a high dimensional structure. Weird. Weird, at least, right? I'm not crazy, right? That's strange to see that happen multiple times like that in one film. <laughs> Uh, because we're really very far from done. Um, well, so the point of this was that uh, this is another distinct type of match that occurs in Hellraiser 3. This is a film with a lot of paintings. It's a film that involves a lot of scenes set in an art gallery. An art gallery that is full of image matches. I mean, just full of them. Virtually every painting on the wall in that place, all the sculptures in that place, and they're all matches. <laughs> so um, in the way of demonstrating that, let's um, teleport over to that scene. One downside of switching to this new system, um, while I talk, I'm going to neutralize this. Um, I don't know why these prints are kind of so washed out and dark. Like, I understand they're trying to preserve all the dynamic range and everything, but, you know, it's a bit much, like... We could use a little more light on these subjects. Okay, that's pretty good. And I, I do think it's also just a slightly washed out. I mean, you don't want to get orange. Yeah, so maybe this is this is slightly pumped, but for analysis, I think it's good. Um, shit, what was I in the middle of saying? Um, oh yeah, the new system here. Uh, this is a young player. Like I said, it doesn't. It has a chapter system, but but those chapters have to be baked into the media in some way. They, they, don't, they don't have a way to do like user bookmarks, which it's a shame to lose that. On the other hand, it means that I really do have to do all this live. What we have gained is thumbnail preview down here, which I'm so happy to have, you know, like an offline player that finally does this correctly. Like, I wish I could make that bigger, way bigger, but... Uh, but still, finally, we have this, you know, we have nice navigation. So anyway, I just happen to know we can zip over here and we're going to be more or less in the art gallery. Um, you know, you can already see it happening here, but I, I just want to find one in particular that really alarmed me. <laughs> just funny because it takes place in a room full of alarms, <laughs> full of alarm bells. You know, already, um, whoops. Use it back, yeah. That's nice. Uh, I, I built it here so that we have, um, I have like a five second reverse time thing right on the pen. Let's press a button and we can zip right back. Um, okay, I want to get the drawing controls up. So, you know, already I'm wigging out because we have this, these banded rectangular structures um, creeping in in the ground. Um, Yeah, it's strange, you know. His cigarette in his right hand, so appearing on the left side, you know, as if we have two rectangles here, and this one, you know, is aligned with this tower-like structure. So, you know, again, it's like, God, it just happens in almost every shot. I, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, but this was not the, um, the point here. I wanted to just cycle this forward a little bit see if we can catch this. It's a sculpture. <laughs> this one is so strange because it really relies on the exact parallax of how this scene works and where the camera is. <sighs> Gosh, this just this image. My goodness. Whew, it's just, it's hard to look at it, but so we have this exactly the same thing here again. <laughs> it's the same thing. Let's go through the motions here, you know. There's the North Tower, right? <laughs> here here in, a, in a rectangle is the South Tower. It's the one with the red explosion here. Let's, um... 
I'm going to lose my diagram momentarily, but this is a good challenge to see if I can remember how to get it back. Um, whoops, that's very annoying. Let's scrub back to where we were. <laughs> um, right, and then what I want to do is I want to make this a little brighter even still. Now I go back to my drawing tools. Sorry, this will get more fluid eventually. I'm sure this isn't very entertaining listening to me <laughs> narrate this. Um, I guess the way to do this now is I go into this weird thing, which has been storing previous states. I select that previous state. And there it is. And we're slightly out of alignment um, down in the video layer. So let's see if we can correct that. Um, shit. <laughs> That's a real limitation. I'm going to have to think about better ways to to do that. I guess I should have handled that by using my jump rewind. Well, anyway, here's how you do it. You position it slightly before, then you grab your state. But is this, oh, that's useful. So this just stuff through states. Now we use my little hack that lets me advance the media player, even though my window focus is still in the draw app. Okay, now we're more or less aligned. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's the red explosion. And what I think is so remarkable about this one in particular uh, is that it also gets the, you know, the the background color temperature correct because it's it's on this blue plate. So that's just a lot of the objective structure of that image again appearing there in this strange way. But then again, it's it's sort of globally correct if you draw the middle of the frame there. I, mean, I know that's slightly fudging it, but it but it is the middle of the sculpture. It's like perfectly the middle of the sculpture, and it hits that line perfectly. It's a very natural place actually to divide the image. And then over here we have you know a burning element, cigarette, red shirt. We see this from the previous image, JP is also wearing matching red boots. So that red twin signature, see, this is the funny thing is, <laughs> I noticed this pattern. I noticed this red twins pattern way before I noticed these patterns. I know this does sound ridiculous probably. I watched this movie and just didn't even see this. <laughs> it whizzed right past me. I mean, I think I saw it and saw that it was strange, but I just didn't know what to make of it. But so anyway, that's part of what I was trying to describe here in this sort of big intro to this subject, if we can call it that, um, is that they, they go together. They appear together. <laughs> they literally kind of, kind of seem to attract each other spatially in the shots as well as appearing together um, temporally in the, you know, in the timeline. Um, so that's one final thing to say about these kind of this global property. And then I just want to look at a bunch of matches. Um, they bunch up in the frame um, because very often we have multiple copies of it. Here we have kind of one really impressive copy and then kind of a, um, a kind of a, 
come on. A kind of fractal echo of it in JP's placement. We also have it happening. We have it happening on many of these images that we pass through, but it's just incredible. I, I, we won't touch on every single, you know. We did a big analysis of this film already, but. Um, well, so. Anyway, um, I do want to just back up here. Ha! Huh, Works so well, that. Um, we have this echo of it. So it does kind of happen. It is kind of bunched up here. It happens almost twice here. But very often it happens more often than that. So it's, it's bunched up spatially, but it's also bunched up on the timeline. Um, in that when these occur, you tend to get many of them together. <laughs> Even if there are a lot of scene transitions in that region. So in other words, it doesn't seem to be the case of, like you might think that, okay, here's an area of the movie where we happen to be in a kitchen and well, when you're in a kitchen, there's a lot of cooking ware, which means there's going to be a lot of aluminum stuff. And there's a lot of food and stoves and, you know, I don't know, ketchup bottles. It's all kinds of things that are going to be red. So there's going to be a high probability in those scenes of these things occurring together. In which case, well, yeah, of course, you're going to see a ton in a dense area, but that's not what I mean. <laughs> of course, I don't mean that. Um, I mean that even when, it, especially when there are dense transitions between things, there, it carries over. It's exactly as if there's been an interference wave <laughs> that's just kind of embedding itself with the maximum redundancy it can. And it, it, and it seems to, I, I really perceive this kind of thing. It seems to kind of travel in, it really is just like a wave shape. <laughs> By which I mean, if you watch these films as they go in the timeline, and maybe, maybe it would be instructive to watch this kind of happen, actually, because we can, we can do this now in our new media environment while I illustrate this. So um, let's get back down into the video layer. Um, whoops. I have, to actually, I, have to, I have to actually tap. That's what's tripping me up. Uh, and let's advance back to the beginning of this sequence. And uh, we'll just let that run. But we're going to let it run... Um, in super slow motion, 0.25x. Um, and then I'll just draw on top of it. Um, so as you watch these films, so here's the timeline of the film. <laughs> We're here right now. And Already, you see some elements occurring, right? We have wires, communication wires here. In fact, it's a we have telephone poles over here. On, on this side, we have towers with red elements. And then we land. I'm going to pause it here briefly. Um, we land. And this is a retread for people that watched the Hellraiser analysis, but... I think it's worth mentioning this stuff again here because, you know, it takes a while for the profundity of this to sink in. Uh, here we go, you know, <laughs> it's handed again, it's just globally in the image. It's blue tones up here, communication towers. <laughs> here we have flames, flaming barrels. In fact, in fact we have, um, Two flaming barrels. One there. And one there. Right? There also here is a just a just a kind of another occurrence of, a, of a, like a pair of rectangular 
things. You know? I know probably for people, <laughs> I don't even know who's watching this or what's going on, but this might seem very strange to focus on um, small geometric things like this, you know? Um, but I just like to say that film is very young and we don't know what a normal film is. <laughs> and we don't know how to think about film. We don't, it's a complicated thing, what it is, you know. And I think when you have complex systems that you can't really figure out, it often makes sense to sort of zoom out and look at very basic properties. So to me, that's not an arbitrary thing. That's a notable thing. Yeah, it's a common thing. There are just rectangles around in the world. You see them all the time. But this is a particular kind of shape in a particular place in an image that's constructed in a particular way that we seem to be kind of on the trail of now on the basis of <laughs> these other things we've seen the film do. Although, of course, if we're watching for the first time, you know, we don't know that yet because we're just right here and all that madness is yet ahead. But anyway, so this is the tip of a, of a wave here. That's, that's, that's about to, be, to become like this and then kind of contract, contract again and then you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, There's already, it's just, it's just, it's already happening here in a pretty, I think a pretty significant way. I don't know, but, but very groundy, you know, very groundy. Uh, but then as it goes along, it starts to, you know, additional clusterings begin to occur. So one of the first things that happens is, I'd like to direct your attention down here, we're going to see these lights change from green uh, through yellow to red. <laughs> Point 0.25 is really slow. Maybe we should speed it up slightly. Um, yeah. That to me is a signature that then is immediately, I mean, just immediately, as soon as those lights change, it cuts and you know, it, we just, we get them. <laughs> and then we get them. And now they're here with some additional material. They appear here with this gridded texture I think maybe now it would be useful to look at some images of the Twin Towers. Open browser. Oh yeah, I do just want to talk about this right now, I guess. Um, this is a great Gematria calculator. You can see I've made it my homepage here and I, I've downloaded a local copy of it. Um, I use this in you know, all of the uh, sort of previous bunch of material. And I'm going to continue to use it because it, it really is the best calculator out there. Uh, unfortunately, I have some pretty serious ideological differences <laughs> with the people that make this calculator. Um, if you go to their website, let's see. Yeah, here we go. Um, It makes me sad to even display this in the middle of like <laughs> what we're talking about here. But um, but this is a significant shadow of what we're doing here. So I, I do want to take a look at it. Uh, God, where to even start with this? Let's just go to their memes. Let's go right to the... So, you know, in addition to making a nice calculator, these guys also run a blog and a bunch of other stuff here. And they host 
a bunch of memes, but you can see it's just like super anti-Semitic stuff. And I've, you know, I know there are maybe a variety of people watching this. Uh, I'm trying to be as diplomatic as I can here. And I say this with empathy as someone who was briefly infected with anti-Semitic uh, ideas uh, for a time. This is just some fucking trash. And it <laughs> it's trash because it connects... Well, here's what I'll just say about this, okay? These correspondences here, okay, the top half of this image blows my mind. And it, it ought to blow your mind. These are some weird... <laughs> and I fact... I fact-checked this stuff. This, this is all true. Yeah, flight 77, 77 minutes after takeoff, hit a building that's 77 feet tall on the 70, you know, this one's kind of... At 777 feet per second, that's actually true. That is actually true. Here's some strange numerological stuff. I'm very interested in this kind of stuff. Um, whether or not you find this interesting is, you know, who knows. Um, I find this quite interesting. Um, I happen to be familiar with the original footage, you know, that they've cropped this in an odd way. Uh, they've cropped it in a way that makes it much more resonant, actually, with the red twin structure. Because on the basis of these images here, we seem to see A sense of <laughs> two rectangles with two little parking cones that are like or it's a strange little symbolic <laughs> thing here but actually the original image isn't quite that way there's I think there's three of these and there's maybe another parking cone I don't remember exactly but this has definitely been altered um but so this is incredible you know this is wow like <laughs> what you know that that ought to those are strange alignments. But the, but the fact that human beings will look at something like this, which is a miracle, and then use that to justify, you know, more... Just, I don't know, yet further terrible hatred and bigotry against their brothers. It just... <laughs> it bums me out, and I wish there was a way to use this tool that didn't promote those people's agenda, if weird anti-Semitic agenda in any way because that is not at all the wavelength that I'm operating on. Um, to me, this is more like... For a while, I was relating to this in a kind of a little bit more of an abstract way, you know, as a... Through a kind of parapsychological lens of like, okay, this was a big precognitive event that happened. I think that's true. But to me, there's a huge religious component to this, spiritual component to this. Um, because I've seen enough of this, I think, to understand that it, it's not just a kind of a, a matter of... Um, how to say this? People are watching this unfold on TV. And they see one thing consciously. They see the Twin Towers blowing up. So that's some, that's some information. And in fact, we do seem to get that information directly represented in some of these artifacts. It pops up over here. Um, strange narrative echoes of the event which had to do with, you know, more or less conscious information about what was happening. 
But then I want to argue that there's also just a ton of strange unconscious associations. People are seeing a lot of things unconsciously when they see this picture. Um, and having also a lot, so there's a lot of unconscious images and ideas and associations. There's also a whole bunch of feelings uh, that people are having when they see this image. I don't know how to draw that. So we're just gonna make lots of weird shapes and I don't know, who knows. And so it seems like all, it seems like that stuff kind of gets all jumbled up together in a, in a big cloud and then kind of rained down onto these films. And then it's up to us through triplanar hermeneutics to reconstruct it. Um, but really you barely have to reconstruct it because I think the stuff is quite at the surface of the, of the image layer of these films. Once you understand how this works, uh, it's a little bit about understanding a symbol system, well, a lot about that, but it's also just a lot about um, under, coming to understand what, what I call the, 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 um, the projection space around this image. It's like we have copies of, of the total subjectivity state when people were watching it. <laughs> and then those copies get encoded into the film in funny ways. So that's the way I was relating to it for a long time and thinking about it kind of in this weird way, like it's a natural process. It's waves and transmission and all of this. And well, there's a lot of reasons to think that it's quite a bit like that. Um, stuff like this really makes it seem like it's like that because, you know, I want to argue that this this particular uh, sort of texture pattern is just a very tight match again for that pattern. The Twin Towers had this, this kind of look, um, this gridded look. Whether or not they looked vertically or horizontally striped depended on, depends on the distance that they were photographed. So in this image, they look very horizontally striped. Um, but that is actually an ambiguity that we see in the original image. So, you know, it's tight. It's a tight correspondence that looks like it happens in some strange way that bypasses any kind of conscious intelligence. It's, it, it seems like just a, cause it's so, cause it's just so much about the low level pattern structure. <laughs> so on that level of thinking, it, it does seem to be some kind of a, I don't know how to say it, a, a psychical transmission, but of a quite natural sort. Of course, it, what isn't natural, you know, these are weird distinctions to start with, but um, but well, so after a while, um, and after some things started uh, happening to me, I began to relate to this in a rather different way. It's just in a less technical way, more as a kind of a ghost energy transfer of some sort, you know, that it's like, this is somehow about the souls of the dead telling their story. Um, and because they're in eternity, they don't observe you know, linear time flow. So they don't care that these movies came out, you know, decade or more in advance of the event. There was an opportunity to tell their story there. And so they kind of, you know, I don't know, here's the director. The ghosts bubbled up in Anthony Hickox's brain and through, and, and you know, and the brain of the screenwriter and, you know, all the other people that worked on it. I don't know. And so these ghosts are kind of secretly steering these people around, whispering things in their ears, as it were, and also, I don't know, somehow conspiring with uh, matter in some strange low-level way in order to arrange these precise accidents that, that then tell their story. <laughs> um, yes, this is the... Um, more or less the level, the pitch at which we're going to be discussing stuff in, 
in, in here now. Things are just getting weird. But so, uh, so anyway, so it's ghosts for a while. And, and well, and again, I think that's true. Again, I actually, I still believe that. Now I see that there's an additional aspect, which is that these films fit together with magical perfection in a way that to me implies authorship on quite a higher level than kind of the disorganized anguish of ghosts. Not that that's somehow insignificant or something. It's hard to imagine something more significant. Well, in fact, the only thing more significant you can imagine, really, uh, is the most significant. So to me, this goes to God. I think that God uh, wrote this story. And the host of 9-11 Dead starred in it. If that sounds gross to people or like I'm having a laugh or fucking around, you know, um, I, I'm not. <laughs> Wish I was. Uh, I really think this happened this way. So, there's just me being clean and direct with you about where my energy is and what I think is happening here. Um, I think it's all of those things, somehow. Somehow I think it's all of those things. Well. You can see that it ha you know, it happens here again. Now this is funny, and I wonder what people are gonna think about this, but. I'll let it play just slightly longer maybe. And I think I'm going to have to... We didn't get to nearly as much stuff as I wanted to get to today, but I think I'm going to have to take a break here. Just stop for now. But the great thing about this format is we can just pick it right up. And, uh, yeah, you know, if I do an hour of this a day or something, we'll get through a ton of material. Um, but so anyway, you know, again, matchy things are occurring here. Um... Here we have to kind of concentrate on this area of the frame. I haven't forgotten about this. We're going to get back to it. Um, yeah, here's our mouth. And, you know, again, it's the it's the broad shape of it is correct. I know I'm partitioning it in different ways here. Like, is it? Are we looking at this as a shape, or are we looking at this as a shape? Well, that's the thing. Different observers probably saw this in a different way. It's ambiguous. I can see it both ways. Here, it seems to be tracking the notion of it as a mouth. There's the teeth. JP's mouth is in a particular curvature here that I think really suggests that. Well, and then over here we have the, the explosive element. And, you know, the, it's just the right <laughs> shape. So that's it. And by the way, cigarettes must be a huge part of the projection space here. Yeah, that's a smoking cigarette. And yeah, this is kind of like if you just draw a line out here. This does start to look rather like a man in a hat, maybe, smoking a cigarette. <laughs> strange, you know, maybe he has long black hair, something like that. Um, maybe he has these funny sunglasses. It all kind of starts to look like like the neighborhood watch dude, you know? Which is very close to the archetypal shadow, you see? Which is what we also see in that anti-Semitic imagery. So it's actually a strange natural association. Well, natural, but you know what I mean? It's a it's a an obvious subliminal potential association to this image. So this is a a shadowy figure 
emitting smoke that is maybe in some kind of a weird hat, that maybe has sunglasses, that maybe has kind of a threatening mouth, you know, something a little frightening about it, potentially. There are many ways to read this image. We're going to consider the North Tower um, through many angles. But this is one way to read it. And one way that we see, we do see many North Tower resonators that are essentially men in, sometimes women, but often men in sunglasses with funny hats. So, I don't know just what to say about this, even to close this out. Just one last thing about, um, about this whole situation. Um, well, it just bums me out, and I hope that I hope that people come to higher levels of awareness. <laughs> Sorry if that sounds condescending. Uh, prejudice and bigotry and stuff is just hard for me. I don't, I've experienced it, I've, you know, coming from the other direction and it's, it's just not very good. So anyway, um, awkwardly stumbling through that subject. I just felt like I had to say something about it because it's just, I'm using this tool. I want to use a different tool, but whatever. This is the only one that gives us live input, so it's important. Uh, I don't know how much Gematria stuff we're going to be doing. Probably some, because, gosh, there's just weird stuff. But uh, I do feel mainly like I want to, for the moment anyway, focus mostly on the pictures. So I was talking about the timeline and the wave shape. Let's see how, how useful is this thing, really. Um, did it save that old drawing for me? I think maybe it did. Huh. That's pretty great. Um, all we need to do is get rid of this. Um, which we'll do while it plays, because there's no reason not to. Um, so it's happening, you know, there's matches happening right away, but they're happening, I would say, in a pretty groundy way. I mean, reading that mouth and that cigarette as a match uh, is entirely dependent, in my opinion, on its position in the sequence. Um, it's the fact that 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 image occurs in proximity to all these other images that are just clustering around it in time, on the timeline, and also kind of in scene space. Um, you know, because here again, we, we just we sort of walk right into another one. Um, this one is in, inverted because the, the red elements down here but here we have a sense of two pyramids. Now they're aligned with the two red boots. Aligned with the two <laughs> grid textured rectangles. Um, if JP is the smoking man, let's say, um, then that would make this the North Tower. So it's all kind of a little scrambled here, but we, we still have the broad sense of, you know, of this landmark, that's the way to read pyramid, sort of landmark duality, and then a practi practical image of the Twin Towers here. And then if we divide the image in half, which happens to fall more or less right through JP's foot there, um, we find that on one side and one side only, we have all this red action. So a mirror Trans, uh, you know, a mirror reflection of something is quite easy to ID. It, you know, it's, it's all the same information. It's just exactly mirrored. So all you have to do is perform a flip and you reconstruct the original. Um, 
I would say in the context that we're looking at sort of rotational things, that gets for me a little harder to kind of understand what's happening or, or, or count, if you know what I mean. Um, but I definitely think that mirror images are, I mean, they're just, very, it's just a, just true that this is very, they're very easy to notice and to ID. And my feeling just kind of eyeballing it is that generally we get correct uh, handedness. Generally. Um, it's quite amazing how often it respects the handedness and actually how often handedness is holographically aligned correctly through multiple planes in in the shot. When I say holographic, that's a bit of a fudge word because I, I don't know, know how to describe this yet. Um, um, but sometimes they don't, but it doesn't matter. I mean, just look what's going on in this shot. There's plenty, an abundance really of, of, uh, of material. Okay, how easy is it gonna be for me to do all this? Pretty easy. <laughs> This is nice. I'm, I'm struggling a little bit to keep track of what I'm saying and also think about all the different, you know, I have like a set of four buttons down here that change what they do depending on which layer of like app I'm in. So it's all just a bit confusing. Um, well, okay, so now we're in the art gallery. Well, again, we're, you know, it's just, again, it's inverted, but here's one that's burning and it's especially aligned with red elements, right? And the other one is an alarm with this rectangular pointy structure. So, North Tower or South Tower. And then I already mentioned here, it kind of happens again. Here's like, you know, the... <laughs> The one with the big mouth, or maybe it's a big eye or whatever, you know, like an eye crying or a mouth with teeth. It also sends the transmissions. It's coming out again here. So you see, it's the elements are all jumbled here. It's hard to infer correct handedness. There's a lot of inversions and things. Uh, the elements are all kind of orbiting around each other. Early on, we had a couple matches. One was quite groundy. You see what I mean? It's, it's, it's happening, it's organizing, but it's not, it seems like it hasn't taken form yet. So that's what I mean about this. There's a natural weird dynamic to this stuff. It, it starts to build. <laughs> well, and then here, something happens in the ground that Actually, it's as if there's a spike here because we get a really strange, in my opinion, a very strange and very perfect match. You know, here's just a big pillar. It's almost, it's not, it's a little too fat maybe. It's almost like proportionally correct, you know. And just at the right place, this red splatter. You can see as it goes by, it's actually, well, you actually can't see it here because it's so subtle. It's part of some, some paint effect that starts up here and presumably goes down beneath it and then comes out there, but you never really see that. And it's, it's lit in such a way as to just really emphasize this thing over here. So we're approaching a major sort of point of organization in the wave. Here we get four images right away Gosh, I really wish we could see these better. It's quite hard to know what's going on in them, but let's do a quick analysis. This I'm pretty sure is, it's like two chicken heads. You know, they have red, I don't know what they're called. There's like weird red things on the top of their heads. <laughs> So, so that's just a statement of the red twins that also happens to invoke chickens, which is a very interesting symbol because it's a matter of kind of chicken and egg. It implies temporal loop, actually. And this is an association that we see in other material, which, you know, this is where it would be nice to non-linearly edit in some stuff or whatever. 
um, we'll we'll look at this film at some point. Freaked is a film. <laughs> Freaked is a film where we see it. Um, a strong connection between red twins material and image matches and uh, double-headed chickens. I also uh, there's also something quite strange involving chickens. I think in critters, uh, or was it critters two? I don't remember. Uh, we'll get to this stuff. Um, but okay, so that's one of the pictures that we get there, kind of magnetically orbiting around this fucking thing. Um, Here's another one. Gosh, this one. I mean, just come on. It's it's structurally so clear, like, there it is. You know, it's just red on the left. Now, again, it's, you know, for the pattern I'm describing, for a dead correct hit, we'd want it down there. But we kind of get it down there in this image, don't we? In any case, it's another image that has, a, like, a strong kind of red component to it that it's very hard to tell there maybe that's just right in the middle it's hard, difficult with like the the angle but to me that look there's a general sense of motion down in this direction you know and I, my feeling is that she's standing i think this is a female figure in like a red dress i'm not sure Maybe this is some inanimate object, I have no idea, but I think it's a figure in a red dress standing by like a stream that then goes up in that direction. I think her feet are kind of there in the image, so I think it I think it is probably like uh, and it's hard to say, but I think it's probably on that roughly barely on that side. That one's clearly on that side. There's kind of grayish blue tones up here. I don't know what we think that is. Um, what we think that is. Is she just in a chair? Or is that a sink even maybe? I don't know, it's strange. Well, in any case, we, we do have a sink. Just a moment. Um, well, and then, okay, in this image, this one really does seem to have just a bunch of red right here in the lower left-hand side and some kind of a gray metallic-like thing here you know, we can't see. This seems to be a red head also that's kind of fused into the ground there. More red heads and just not like... I don't know, what's your explanation for that? <laughs> <laughs> that to me is quite strange so there's a lot of strange structure constellating here so we're in a you know more sort of peak activity I would say in this wave although to me the first real real striking thing I mean this is pretty incredible but the first thing that to me is like a strong match is uh, we do get a little bit more look at that this just looks like an abstract image an abstract painting um here clear out this stuff that's a little annoying i guess i have to remember to go in here before i do that then that clears it <sighs> then i can click back into here where I'm going to back us, whoops, it didn't work, how annoying, click here and back us up, nope, 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 sorry, errors everywhere, there we go, finally, I think I'm getting tired as well, I said I was going to stop this soon. Um, let us play here, and we don't, we don't need to watch it so slow. It's, oh, how is this happening? Didn't double, double, didn't double click, I guess. That's a little bit, a little bit better. Um, so 
we do actually see a little bit more of those paintings there. Let's see here. I wonder if that isn't a bird. I mean, that would be quite incredible if it was. So see a little bit more of this painting. It's hard to tell. Maybe there's some figurative stuff there. It looks like it's just abstract. And actually looking at it now, hmm. well, this is a perfect opportunity to use some um, magnify tool. This is quite nice. I think you can resize the window to be an arbitrary size. And of course you can control the zoom level in it. Um, so let's make this a little longer. Um, this app, by the way, um, I'm assuming is not <laughs> made by uh, racists and it is called Sword Soft Screen Ink Free, <laughs> using the free version. Um, but it's great. Like it's enabling all this cool um, I'm not sure where we are now. There we go. Where is that look? Oh, it's in it's in its own weird thing. OS 10 is weird now. Um, yeah, it's providing this magnify stuff and all these other nice drawing functions and all of this. Um, but so you can really see here, it's unreal. Like, I think there's two streaks there. <laughs> yeah. Quite incredible. So, okay. Um, Oh, come on. Because I did some strange window focus thing, I've lost the ability to exist in the world, apparently. How to get out of this? Ah, escape. Wonderful that that exists. Um, okay, so... Come on now. <laughs> I'm definitely tired and I should stop this in a second. Um, as these images spin around, it's just really hard to know what's happening in that image. Actually, hold on. Oh, gosh. That's quite funny, actually. Yeah, this isn't... Aha. Maybe this was obvious to everyone else, but I, I just put this together. Um, this actually is an image of a sink. This is the image of the figure clutching the sink. I thought this was a chicken with two heads. This is like a two red headed chicken thing. God, that's strange. It does kind of end up looking like that, especially from that previous angle. But no, it's this other image which we which we see in a little bit here. Let's um scroll over to it. There it is. I think, right? But wait a minute. No, that's funny because it can't be there because it doesn't make sense in the space for it to be there, right? Or am I going crazy? This is, you know, <laughs> I hope I hope this is useful to some people or people are enjoying this or whatever. Um this is very much just kind of my diary <laughs> trying to figure out what it is I'm looking at here. Um, 
Is it not that image? Well, I don't know. Here, let's do a comparison. Um, let me get into the image layer. Let's go capture. Now we will back it up. Ugh, come on. It's accurate, but it's not quite accurate enough for what I need to do for this kind of stuff. I really do think that's the same image. Just to follow through on our little comparison here. Um, Photoshop could help us reconstruct it, but yeah, I th I'm pretty sure that's the same image, right? That's the, whoops. There's the, there's that leg. There's the head and the little red element coming out of that side. There's the hand going up. There's the edge of the toilet so that is the same image so that that means that for sure um hickox is playing around here because there it appears between these two paintings um come on what's going on here Quite incorrect. I'm not sure why I'm not getting my erase behavior correctly. Well, who knows? I guess what I want to do is I just want to. Oh my god. Getting tired and unable to like remember all these button combinations. What the fuck is that? Also, it does seem to be like not responding correctly now. I think I tripped it up in some strange way. So I have to actually go interact with the proper menu, which means selecting the mouse there. Right, and so then and then here it appears next to the door. So yeah, that means that, that Hickox has just placed it multiple times. So he really wants you to see it. But then look at it. <laughs> it's yet another image that exhibits this property. I understand, you know, that in in a more mundane read of this film, this is maybe about addiction or something. Like maybe this is a person with a nicotine addiction. Uh, I was a pack a day cigarette smoker for many years. Um, you know, throwing them all in the toilet was was a kind of like neurotic quit, but I'm not really going to quit behavior that I had about it at some point. Um, so I do see that it's evocative of that and can begin to sort of see how that fits into the story this is, film is telling. But it also aligns with all these other images we've seen and aligns with this image in a very precise way because... Oh, that's really annoying. I wish that would not happen. Um, okay, so now I want this to go away again. Is there anything just working again? <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes it just gets into weird window focus states that I can't recover from. We have to think a little bit about that. Um, so, you know, we have the two rectangles. This one has an element that's, you know, I want to emphasize the color space of this again. This antenna has 
sort of white or metal areas and then this black area. So we have exactly the same colors here. It's just white and black in broadly the same shape in broadly the correct place on that rectangle to create a North Tower resonator. This one also happens to literally be a sink, you know? Um, you can see it more clearly there. But so that's a bunch of aluminum piping stuff again. <laughs> And then, well, this is the one that's picked out. Again, it, ha it's, it's, it happens like twice. It's like there's red there in the rectangle. There's red things that burn, again, over here. This big red thing, which is, to me, this is like a pool of blood. This is something we see a lot in the Radiohead imagery. Um, this implies a context of mass slaughter. And it is, you know, it makes contact with the right side of the frame. It doesn't touch the left side. So it's just barely handed, actually. And I want to emphasize correct diagonality. The toilet a toilet on fire, you know, I said we were going to meditate on this. We didn't quite get to this. I think the next time I open this up, we'll spend an extended period of time just thinking a bit about this picture. Because we actually haven't looked at any of the impressive, to my mind, like the truly impressive lineups in Hellraiser yet. This is just you know, getting back to our timeline. The first crest of organization in the first wave, and these waves seem to build as they go through the film. So we're not going to be going through Hellraiser in detail. There are actually just two more kind of areas of the film that I want to look at um, before we then start to do a very wide filtered uh, transmedia jump between a whole bunch of material tracking these tracking this picture and how it manifests in these films. Um, Gosh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm afraid. I think I've lost my train of thought a little bit as well. It's just it's staring at it. It's just my goal is to is to get <laughs> is to get I don't know some other people in the world with having the same weird feelings about these pictures that I do because I just this is just too much for one dude to deal with. Frankly, like this is bizarre, bizarre. <laughs> the way it lines up with JP there. Um, okay, so now what I want to do is I want to bring up that focus. Aha, that's my problem. I keep hitting that button. There we go. So now we just get back to normal mouse land. Close those. And... Return, come on, <laughs> return to our film. Well, so it organizes there, it kind of comes up multiple times in those paintings, um, I think, especially if you read those paintings together. I don't know what to make of that weird chicken thing. It's a strange aspect, first of all, of doing this kind of analysis, because we're, we are looking at patterns that are pitched subliminally. So, um, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about these issues and sort of how we navigate them uh, in the last batch of archive material. We'll probably talk about some of that stuff again here. Um, that's why you search for high dimensional structures. And that's what this whole triplanar thing is meant to kind of help with. Exactly the figure I this is again here, always on this side. Well, okay. Um, I 
I guess that's it for for now. Just because I'm getting exhausted. Look, look at this. Just, um, yeah. Next time we'll talk more about this picture. Uh, I hope this was cool, uh, interesting at least. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out and see you in the future.